Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the Executive Director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're the Indiana Voice for Peace, Justice, Human Rights, and Intercultural Encounter. I'm also a member of the Palestine-Israel Network of the United Church of Christ. We're delighted uh, today to speak with uh, a young woman who's become a friend over the years as my groups have visited with her the last six or seven or eight years now, Sahar, uh, that we've come to Israel and Palestine, uh, conscientious objector and activist, Sahar Vardi. Uh, Sahar works with other refusers and serves as coordinator of the American Friends Service Committee Israel program in East Jerusalem. Uh, Sahar, uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, I know that you have a number of friends uh, uh, who are turning in, uh, tuning in today, Sahar, and uh, we're all wanting to know how you're doing personally during this pandemic time. Yeah, I was just uh, starting to see familiar faces on the screen, which is nice. Um, and, and I also always feel the need to apologize because the one thing I have learned during this pandemic, working a lot from home, is that the camera on my computer is terrible and always has very bad lighting, so I apologize for that. Um, but as far as the pandemic goes, I, I am lucky enough that I can say that, that things have been going pretty well. Um, we have been on and off on, on lockdowns here in Jerusalem, uh, but currently are not on lockdown, have not been for a little over a month. I was just telling Michael before that that very much might change the, the levels of uh, COVID infections are going high, uh, yeah, are increasing constantly right now um, in Israel generally, uh, as well as the West Bank. So there unfortunately might be a chance that we'll go back into lockdown. But uh, again, I'm, I'm of the more lucky people who have been able to, uh, yeah, have a home to shelter in and, and a steady job, unlike a lot of people around who are losing their jobs. So can't really complain. You know, um... Uh, Haaretz just published uh, an article with the title, Israeli hospitals see first signs of systems collapse from coronavirus. And the subtitle is ICU beds, resources for non-COVID patients dwindling with officials describing extreme stress on the staff as the coronavirus keeps spreading. Um, tell us more about uh, the situation for first responders, as we call them, you know, the healthcare workers and the hospital situation. Yeah, I think what we're seeing here is that um, in many ways, Israel's first wave was much better controlled with quarantines and, and, and far from perfect. And, and it has a lot of economic cost, obviously. Um, but it looks like now the, the kind of the economy is talking much louder than health. Um, and there isn't really, they're not as closing as much things and, and things of the sort. Um, and so we're seeing this huge increase, which, which is leading to the end of the capacity of, of hospitals. Um, they're also talking about the, uh, the lack of um, protecting, protection here for medical professionals. Uh, so they're talking about the fact that in the coming week, um, there will probably be a, start a, a significant shortage in protection here. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot happening here. I will say that one of the things that happened a couple of weeks ago uh, was a strike of nurses in hospitals uh, that were striking just to, to have more staff. That was their demand uh, because of the situation. And, and they did it, ma managed to actually get it. So there's a little bit of places where kind of pressure and uh, especially unionizing has been effective in helping uh, health professionals deal with this crisis. But for the most part, it definitely looks like we're just uh, standing just before um, a, a much bigger crisis of the health system because of COVID. I want to follow up with that. But before I do, I failed to mention earlier that to prevent Zoom bombing, we're keeping people's screens uh, muted and their pictures uh, uh, muted as well. Uh, if Folks, if you'd like to submit a question to uh, Sahar, please do that via the chat function at the bottom of the screen and where I'll be monitoring for your questions. Uh, so back to, back to the COVID uh, crisis in Israel, Sahar, uh, you talked about within Israel itself, what about uh, uh, the Palestinians who live within Israel? And what about, uh, do you know what about the uh, uh, healthcare situation in the West Bank? 
So for the Palestinians living, Gaza as well. Yeah. So for the Palestinians living uh, within Israel, there's been a few cities specifically uh, more affected than others, and when that has happened, there have been also local uh, lockdowns of specific regions. Um, and so there, there has been that effect, but we haven't seen something significantly different so far in, in infection than the rest of uh, the Jewish population. As far as the West Bank is concerned, um, there was quite a, a big wave of infections uh, two or three weeks ago that included a general lockdown between Palestinian cities. That wasn't as bad as the first wave as far as the lockdown is concerned, but um, there was quite a bit of lockdown. We saw the first deaths, uh, Palestinian uh, deaths of COVID. It was one in the first wave, but the, the first serious deaths uh, were now in infections in, in different areas, including in more rural areas that really didn't see any infections um, before and obviously don't have as good medical um, facilities either. Uh, so that's definitely, definitely a concern. It's still not uh, to the degree that it is uh, within Israel. There's so much less um, infection happening within Palestinian uh, areas. So we'll kind of have to see what's going to happen. It is important to say that we have just now passed the second holiday uh, during COVID. So both uh, Ramadan and then and then Eid al-Fitr, but now Eid al-Adha, uh, the most recent holiday happened during uh, COVID. And obviously every time there's a holiday like that, the same happened with Jewish holidays, there is a wave of infection because people do meet their family eventually and so on. So there were a lot of lockdowns around that as well. Um, in Gaza, I mean, knock on wood, but Gaza has been very much under control as far as COVID goes a lot because um, Hamas uh, authorities have really um, created very, very strict guidelines on coming into the Gaza Strip. And anyone that does uh, has, has forced uh, quarantine a very long, much longer than other places, really from an understanding of the authorities there that once you will have one people, one person um, in Gaza actually infected who's not quarantine, this could really create a huge, huge, huge disaster. Um, and so, so far, they've actually been been able to, to really prevent the spread uh, within the Gaza Strip. Again, knock on wood, um, let's hope this stays the same way. That really could be a, a terrible crisis. Already, uh, I want to stay on this topic just a little longer. Already in March, um, as the impact of the COVID crisis was just beginning to sink in, you wrote on the American Friends Service Committee uh, blog page, uh, uh, an article with the title, are governments violating human rights and civil liberties in their co uh, coronavirus response? Now, talk to us a little bit about the Israeli government's COVID response and its uh, adverse impact on Palestinians in both in Israel and uh, the occupied territories? Well, I think there's a few different levels of how that manifests. Uh, the first one that we saw from the very, very beginning of, of the first wave of COVID um, was just the kind of normal, I don't want to call it normal because it's not, but kind of the, the normal Israeli policing um, and response to Palestinians continuing through COVID. And what that meant was, as an example, um, night raids into Palestinian villages just continued as normal, but this means, uh, in many cases, police officers without even protection gear, without masks and so on, um, would continue to go into Palestinian villages, arrest people, and completely disregard um, the fact that there is a pandemic and, and the, the, their existence there and this proximity that happens when you arrest someone uh, and riots and things of the sort, um, obviously are different uh, during a pandemic. But beyond that, what we saw already at that stage uh, and continue to see is things like Israel closing down uh, clinics, Palestinian COVID clinics, um, because they have to do something with the Palestinian Authority and then they're in Jerusalem or all kinds of different excuses, um, arresting people who were uh, um, sanitizing, uh, like using different um, sterilization uh, equipment, uh, things of the sort. So really, and we just saw last month, uh, the closing down by Israel of a COVID clinic in Hebron, while in Hebron, uh, there was the biggest outbreak within Palestinian cities. So this is kind of, you know, occupation as, as usual, only mm. around what's happening now as a reality, um, which, which obviously has a huge effect on people's lives. Uh, the other part of that that we um, have seen, and this is kind of more broadly, 
is things like surveillance. So contact tracking that the Israeli security services are now doing um, surveillance of phones of all uh, Israeli citizens. And this is interesting because in many ways, this actually affects Palestinians much less because their phones have already been surveilled, right? This is not news. Um, oh, it's so, actually just- uh, so, so repeat that just for us to hear. So the Israeli government is, is surveilling Israeli citizens' phone calls? Well, not the phone calls, but the location. Um, so what okay. they're doing is, is checking locations theoretically, to be able to say, you know, if there was a person who was affected by COVID at this and this spot, then anyone who was in their proximity at that time uh, would get an automatic um, text message saying, you need to go into quarantine. Uh, and these are mandatory quarantines. Now, there's a lot to say about how inefficient the system is. Uh, it's, it, there's a huge amount of flaws in it. And, and many countries that have been using similar systems have seen those flaws um, and back down from those systems. But I think the other thing to, to consider here, that this is not just a question of, of the flaws in it, it's also a question of normalizing surveillance and normalizing the idea that governments get to track the, the whereabouts of their citizens. Um, and, and there's a lot of fear and has been uh, here around, for instance, the ability now with the fact that there are mass protests against the government, Israeli Jewish, predominantly Israeli Jewish, protests against the government happening at the moment. And really all it takes is for the government to decide to send an automatic text to everyone who was in that location of a protest of 10,000 people um, and put them in quarantine for two weeks, right? Like this is not yet happened, but it's very clear that this could be a tool um, that is used to suppress protests. We have been, we have seen uh, fines used to suppress protests. So fines against people uh, for not wearing masks in a protest, even if they are wearing a mask, um, or for not standing uh, far away enough, uh, according to social distancing, even when they are. Um, so it's really just like this fine system that has been brought in around COVID restrictions is being used to suppress. These fines were eventually overturned, um, but that doesn't, uh, it doesn't change the the chilling effect that a lot of these things have. You mentioned to me that uh, earlier that you've been arrested three times in the last month and a half. Um, and I know from your Facebook page that you've been participating in a number of uh, demonstrations in recent weeks. One, uh, you wanted uh, the release of the video footage outside Lion's Gate with uh, where uh, Iyad Ahalik was murdered by Israeli military on his way to a special needs school. Um, we're also outraged. Well, tell us about the protests uh, uh, that you've been participating in. I think also um, uh, about Silwan. Is that correct? A, a family in Silwan, you were participating in a, a protest there. Talk to us about what you've been up to the last few weeks and why you're always in trouble. Why you're always in trouble. Uh, I'm not in trouble. I'm just, uh, you know, <laughs> trying to, to communicate what's happening around us. But, you know, the, uh, last... the, recent, uh, the, the recent death of a civil rights icon here, John Lewis in the United States, he talked about being in good trouble. And so that's how I was uh, referring to you. Go ahead, please. <laughs> There's uh, the organization in the U.S. Beautiful Trouble that is uh, talks about different kind of civil resistance tools. So we, we yeah, I, I guess that comes from the same place. Um, yeah, so I mean, the last few weeks have been pretty intense as far as activism goes. I think that in many ways, uh, the, the lockdowns themselves obviously made it impossible in many ways to to mobilize. But the moment the lockdowns ended, um, many more people were coming out of the streets, and then uh, really there was this shooting of Iyad al Khalat. Uh, a, a young man, young Palestinian man with special needs um, who was, was shot and killed in, in the old city in Jerusalem. And it's very clearly, I mean, a racist, um, racist killing that really only has to do with the fact that Israeli police and military, in, in this case, border police, are trained to shoot first and ask questions later when it comes to Palestinians. Um, and so there were actually, it was actually very impressive to see the amount of outrage within Israeli society, including uh, going out to protest. We did quite a few very large protests, including some that have met, that managed to kind of uh, 
block roads in central Jerusalem, which is something that usually kind of anti-occupation uh, protests don't get to those sizes, don't have that energy in them. And it really felt like people were really outraged about this. Um, one of the arrests that I was involved in was, was around one of those protests. Um, the other thing that's been happening, we've been very much campaigning around uh, during this time is a uh, Palestinian family in the uh, neighborhood of Silwan in East Jerusalem, which is under threat of eviction uh, technically by the Jewish National Fund, the JNF, um, that for a very long legal reason that I won't go into, but mainly has to do with the absentee property law, um, the JNF claims ownership to their house and is in process of evicting them. Unfortunately, a month ago, they lost their trial, the family lost their trial, and so uh, they could be evicted. They're appealing that at the moment. Um, but this is a not only an interesting case because um, we're talking about an expansion, expansion of a, a Jewish settlement within this neighborhood of Sidwan, which is just south of the old city. It's a very strategic place for a settlement. Um, so it's not only the expansion of that and the eviction of a Palestinian family, it's also done by an international organization, by the Jewish National Fund, uh, that is a much more mainstream, or at least an organization that tries to present itself as mainstream and not just a settler organization. And that also means that pressure can actually work with them. Um, and it has for years. And this is the third time they're trying to evict this family, but for years we've been able to postpone it. Um, and the reason that I, I do wanna kind of linger on that for a moment is just to say how important pressure is in this point. And this is really a place, especially because JNF has a lot of US um, and other North American presence. Uh, yeah. That really is a campaign that can be taken in other places as well and really does have an effect and, and has the potential of being able to prevent the eviction of this family. Um, so just last week, we, uh, a group of activists uh, tied ourselves to the entrance to the JNF office here in Jerusalem, um, not allowing their, their employees into the office in the morning. Uh, so got arrested for that as well. But um, really, the, the, the main thing is at this point is, is to kind of bug the JNF. Um, the last kind of protests that are happening now, and I do think it's important to say that there, it's a bit away from our usual political conversation, um, but it is really interesting, is the protests uh, generally against the government now. Um, and it started with the conversation about corruption, and, and uh, our, our prime minister is currently under quite a few different investigations for corruption, uh, including indictments and an uh, ongoing trial. Um, and it expanded because of COVID, because of the economic effects of COVID and the fact that the government has been doing a terrible job in responding to them, uh, to the needs of people, people who've lost their jobs, people who've lost their income. Um, so it's kind of expanded into this much larger, we don't trust this government um, and this government is not doing its job and is corrupt, kind of a wider idea of, of corruption. Um, and it's really grown into a huge protest movement that would, you know, dozens of people getting arrested. It's not something we're used to seeing here, protesting on the streets, blocking roads. Uh, we're talking about at least three protests a week at the moment um, in Jerusalem and, and also in other cities in the country with thousands and thousands of people. And I think the interesting thing about um, these protests for me has been that while their core is really just anti-Netanyahu and very much about replacing him, um, they're the content of them has been much, much wider. Um, and just as, exa as an example to that, uh, for instance, uh, slogans of, or chants of justice for Iyad, the same uh, Palestinian person who was killed uh, a month and a half ago, are a very, very common chant in these protests, which is really interesting. And kind of the more the police has been violent towards the protesters, the more this kind of anti uh, police violence and police racism has come up. And now we see more Ethiopian protesters coming with the content of, um, of police racism towards Ethiopians and connecting that to pol police racism towards Palestinians. And it's, I'm not going to tell you that it's, I don't want to draw a beautiful picture, you know, <laughs> of some revolutionary force. Uh, but I will say that that voice is becoming stronger and stronger in the protests. An anti-occupation voice is present very clearly in the protests. And one of the things we're really trying to kind of push right now is, is trying to see how we can bring in these young people who are coming out to protest um, around these things that, that really change their lives and their own unemployment and so on. How do we bring them into a larger message that talks about 
a democratic system in essence and what does the democratic system in essence mean and obviously it doesn't mean a different law for Jews or Palestinians that's not very democratic it doesn't mean a martial law over Palestinians that's not very democratic so kind of widening the idea of what democracy is for a democracy for all um, and it's interesting to see how it is possible to have that conversation within these protests you raised a, a whole lot of things I want to follow up on uh, here uh, with that with that uh, response. Let me let me just go back and pick one, two, three for for your uh, reply. I want to go back to Silwan just for a second. Just a couple of days ago, a little four year old uh, uh, girl uh, was killed by a stray bullet. Uh, um, talk talk to us about. I mean, yes, there's this expansion of a settlement within Silwan, but really the goal is to obliterate the neighborhood, right? For this city of David kind of expansion down the hill, right across the road into the neighborhood. Uh, to talk to us about the larger context here, uh, uh, that, that why we should be paying attention to Silwan, in addition to the JNF. Yeah, I mean, so Silwan is really, as I said, just for the, to the south of the old city, so very close to, to Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Haram al-Sharif, uh, Temple Mount. Um, and, and so it's kind of a very strategic point and, a very, and has been a, a focus for settler activities for quite some time beyond the settlement of the city of David um, that is also going underground. So 70% uh, of the underground of Silwan is already controlled by, by the settler organization. Um, but there's also a lot of other houses throughout the neighborhood that are uh, already in control of uh, by, by settlers. And really a lot of the kind of strategy around that is that there's a settler strategy of taking over what's called the Holy Basin, the ring around the old city of Jerusalem and trying to create as many settlements as possible in that ring. Um, and Sinwan is a huge part of that. And the reason for that is mainly that if you secure a, a ring of settlements around the old city, in many ways, you're preventing any future of a two-state solution or, or any kind of Palestinian capital in Jerusalem. Because obviously a Palestinian capital in Jerusalem would need access to the old city in Jerusalem, to, um, to Haram al-Sharif, to Al-Aqsa Mosque. And, and if you close that area with settlements, it's kind of a checkmate. Right, um, and so that's a lot of the the focus of the settler movement. Uh, I think it is important to say that right now in in Siwan, um, I mean, there was a demolition, a house demolition in Siwan today. There was a house demolition in Siwan yesterday. Um, so that's also something that's happening. And again, at a time of COVID, right? You tell people shelter at home, and then you literally demolish their home. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's kind of important to, to put that context in, but this is part of an ongoing policy really of trying to make the lives of people in Siwan um, as, as bitter as possible. I will say this is true for a lot of neighborhoods in East Jerusalem. Siwan is kind of, it's, it's, it's even more increased, um, that pressure. But again, it's true for a lot of different neighborhoods, unfortunately. Um, in, in East Jerusalem. I will say specifically about the, the, the shooting of the four-year-old from a stray bullet, we still don't know the, the story there, what was it about? Um, and so I, I, like, I, I don't wanna say something specifically about that, but the general context of the neighborhood um, is obviously, yeah, one of huge uh, oppression of, by, by Israel. You also referred to the uh to the uh, 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 anti-Netanyahu -Net protests. But we also know that the alternatives uh, aren't much better with regard to civil rights and, and human rights. The, the, goal, the, the goal of the protests uh, is to oust Netanyahu and then take it from there and, and keep pressure on whoever comes next. Or talk to us a little bit about the inside ethos of the protests and demonstrations. Well, I think one of the interesting things about these protests is that there isn't an answer to that question. Most of the people who have come to the protests know that right now in Israel's current political um, reality, there is an alternative. But the idea is if we say enough not to this, then an alternative will grow, right? Someone will come along that will have, will present that. Um, and I think that that is, uh, there's a, it's, it's a kind of an interesting 
form of activism that comes from so much despair, um, you know, kind of a place of, of huge amount of, of pain, of hurt of people, of complete distrust of the system, that just saying, we will not accept this, and a huge amount of hope that if we say we, don't not, we do not accept this, something else will grow out of it. And I think that the interesting thing about this movement is really not just its, its public uh, statement, which is get rid of Netanyahu, we hope someone else that's a little bit better will come along. Um, but more than that, it's different groups. It, it is extremely decentralized, different groups coming with their own messages, um, creating their own decision-making structures, it's a huge amount of kind of democratic, like internal democratic decision making within the different groups that are working and collaborating and each one is bringing their own thing and their own creativity. And it's a really interesting space of saying, we might not, like we're very on purpose, not saying this is this person is the alternative to Netanyahu. That's not what we're about. It's not just about Netanyahu, it's about the system that he represents. And so whoever comes to try to replace that from a political perspective or a party politics perspective, will have to, to really address and, and, and present an alternative to that system, which I think is much deeper than saying, okay, this other politician should, should be in power instead. You also mentioned uh, mobil the mobilization of young people. And uh, I've been on your Facebook page uh, quite a bit the last uh, few days and, and it was tagged on July 15th, and here's what it said. Another demonstrator, Sahar Vardi, a Jerusalem young woman arrested during the rally said, it was possible to see that we are young people who are no longer ready to shut up and be nice. And uh, I, I guess I want you to tell us about not only that, but about the mobilization of young people uh, uh, on the Israeli left are just, you're fed up. I mean, they're, they're, there's a sense of being fed up with the COVID crisis and the militarization, all the rest. Talk to us about the mobilization of the youth. Yeah, so the, it's, it was an interesting moment that uh, July 14th, uh, because in many ways until then, most of these anti-corruption protests were led uh, by kind of people in their 60s, um, who've been doing this for months and months, some even for years, have been protesting about this same thing. They, they created a tent city outside of uh, the prime minister's house, um, but it was very clearly kind of almost a generational thing. Um, and it was, it was not young. And this was this one day in which a lot of young people finally arrived. And that also meant that the protests looked completely different. It was much less nice, right? It was blocking roads, blocking the light rail in Jerusalem. When the police came with uh, water cannons and so on, the protest didn't disperse. It tried to continue through that, still non-violently, very, very clearly, um, but much more active, much less nice or, or polite. Um, and I think that that energy has really changed the protest. It's what made them what they are today, what really allowed them to grow. And it's, if I kind of think about the why to it, um, I think there's a lot of, of speculations. I don't think we really know. Uh, but first of all, this is a generation that economically has been a disaster for a very long time. And around the world, it's, it's kind of one of the first time, first generations um, that is by definition less better off than their parents. It, you, it used to be the other way around. And this is, we're kind of seeing this phenomenon of, of a generation that uh, economically is, is doing worse. Um, and in Israel, that's very, very clear. Uh, it's a generation that doesn't stand a chance to own a house ever, um, while again, our parents' generation could and our grandparents even more could. Um, and the other thing that happened with COVID is, is a huge amount of unemployment, especially with young people. It was very easy to uh, fire them. Um, and I, I, I dare say, um, it's also with COVID, people who otherwise at this time would be partying, enjoying themselves, going out, and now can't go out to anywhere, right? Um, and it means that all that energy, both the frustration and the political energy, but also there's the energy of seeing other humans around you is all kind of mobilized together to these protests, which also makes these protests 
as creative as they are. There's been concerts in these protests, full orchestras coming to the protests as they are. Um, huge amount of like artists doing different uh, exhibitions and, and, and things of the sort in the protest. So it's actually bringing all that energy that usually would be part of a nightlife or, or part of a gallery or so on, bringing it into the street, into the political sphere, which I, I really find beautiful. I've got two questions from the chat room, so let me get to them. Uh, uh, one's from our good friend, uh, Jim Harb. Sahar, when we met you and heard you in July 2018, you said then that it was almost impossible to organize around the occupation due to the relatively extreme militarization of Israeli society. Now you're saying that at demonstrations, there's an anti-occupation voice. Has that much anti-occupation space opened up in two years? Please say more about this change. That's a great question. Um, and and I, I, I would love for two years ago me to be here now. Um, but we were actually genuinely extremely surprised in the first protest when we came uh, on, on that July 14 protest, uh, myself and, and a couple of friends, came with some handmade signs saying democracy for all, uh, it's time to create a democracy, kind of clarifying it never happened, and justice for Iyad. Um, and a few people came up and said like, good job on that sign or like things like that, but it was very clearly not a big um, part of that conversation. We were pleasantly surprised that there wasn't a lot of attacks against those signs. And in the protest after that, a few days later, there were like six or seven other people with signs of justice for Iyad. And the protest after that, it became just a chant that everyone was, was, was chanting. And it was, I mean, for me, really fascinating to see that in many ways, a lot of, um, I mean, there's kind of two, two theories of what we can say of how that happened. One is saying a lot of the people who were anti-occupation and vocal anti-occupation 10 years ago, uh, when our numbers were much higher, disappeared because it, it wasn't, there was no energy behind it. It didn't look like it's changing anything. And now they're finding themselves again in these protests because there's energy and so on. And they can also bring that content back and that anti-occupation content back. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is youth or young people who are seeing the violence, seeing the police violence and, and, and seeing the police brutality used against them. And it makes them make that switch a bit in their heads um, on what does that also mean for, for other people. Uh, and so in many ways, this is kind of an optimistic time. Um, and, and relatively, I mean, I will say, I am surprised um, of the fact that, like usually in these kind of scale of protests, when we would bring anti-occupation things, we would be booed away. And when I say usually, I also mean protests two months ago. Uh, that's what happened. And somehow in these protests right now, with the energy that's happening in them, um, with, I guess, again, the, the, the desperation that people come with, they're not just not booed to, but people are actually joining that. Um, and I guess the, the big challenge for us now is really how do we bring them in um, and have that not be just a blip that's happening right now, but actually sustainable. I find that, you know, uh, that gives me hope. Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of hope that again, we won't be having this conversation two years from now and someone will remind me, you were hopeful in that moment. What about now? And I'll be like, nah, nah, that was just a blip. So I'm kind of hoping that's well, not where we're gonna be. Well, you know, we're finding that here too. I mean, uh, uh, there's an energy, there's an energy that has been lacking for decades. And, and you know, s some, some people thought that after the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and other protests that the, things would kind of simmer down a little bit in the cities. But what, no matter what it is, the confluence of forces, anti-Trump, the COVID desperation, uh, the, the lack of work, uh, the Black Lives Matter, move, all these forces are kind of coalescing here. And there's just a kind of a continuous momentum to the demonstrations in our cities. And, uh, some of it nonviolent, some of it uh, uh, more extreme, but you know, the, it's, it's not dying down. 
yeah, it's really inspiring to to see. And obviously, people are making connections. I think again, we need to put it in in context. What's happening right now in Belarus? What's happening right now in Lebanon? Um, and there's mass protests in quite a few different places right now, um, which in many ways, like crises like this, bring up everything that's wrong in the system on so many different levels. Yeah, right. It's one of the things that COVID does. Um, and we really see that playing out in different places. And, and the, the good part of it is it also makes people stand up and resist in all these different places. I want to come back to just one more question about the coronavirus. And that is uh, the recent uh, Israeli Supreme Court decision uh, that ruled that Palestinian prisoners have no right to socially distance uh, from each other. Uh, the justice has accepted the argument that Palestinian prisoners were no different than roommates or family members while they were in prison. So can you tell us a little bit more about the state of Palestinian prisoners within Israeli prisons? And is this being appealed? Or that, that was the Supreme Court, so there is no appeal. Talk to us a little about the activism around Palestinian prisoners. Well, I will say that, that it's important, again, um, while there's a huge amount of Palestinian prisoners and they're definitely getting the worst part of it. Um, this is true for all prisoners, right? This is a ruling that has to do with, with the Israeli prison system. Um, and I think like in the US, there's a lot of conversations now about incarceration uh, because what it means under a pandemic is even worse than, than the usual conditions. There should have been a conversation like that here and it's not happening here. And that's interesting. I mean, there was a Supreme Court around it uh, NGOs are doing that work or talking that conversation. But in effect, in Israeli society, that's not a very dominant conversation. And I think a lot of it is because of so much of the narrative around prisoners has to also do with, with Palestinian prisoners, with Palestinian political prisoners, um, that that's one of those places that Israel is not ready to have that conversation yet, um, which is, I mean, obviously extremely sad. Um, and in effect has a huge effect now in prisons. We have seen a few prisons where there has been uh, waves of infections. Um, it's also important to say that Palestinian prisoners have lost the right for visitation during this entire time. Um, and in some cases, phone calls, which is really something that I don't, e I don't even know how you explain that, right? How do you, why have phone calls have to do with COVID? Obviously COVID does not transfer through the phone. Um, but but that's also been happening. And unfortunately, that has not been much of a, a, a public discourse um, criticizing that at all. So again, there's here and there, some people talking about it, some people trying to raise awareness to it. But in the grand scheme of things, that is not something that has been uh, really taking the headlines, unfortunately. There's another question uh, from the chat room. While admitting that there's no average Jewish immigrant uh, they come for different reasons, but here's the question. Does the average Jewish family moving to Israel and into a settlement have a full understanding of the implications and the damage being done to Palestinian families? Um, well, I mean, yeah, with, with all the, the qualifications of that, um, I would generally say not necessarily. So there are the people who move for clear ideological reasons, uh, and probably have a much better understanding of the damage they're creating, which they obviously don't see as damage. Um, but for the most part, most, uh, also most Israelis who move into settlements, but that's also very true for uh, immigrant families um, or Jewish immigrant families who, who come to Israel as part of the uh, Jewish law of return um, and do what, what we call aliyah, get citizenship for being Jewish and move sometimes into settlements. Uh, for the most part, have no idea what they're really doing there. If they have even an idea that what, what a settlement is and what the general political thing around settlements uh, is, they still won't see it as something that's per personally around their role. Um, and the reason for that is that settlements, except for very ideological outposts, most settlements don't look like, you know, you're, a, you're in the middle of nowhere and some, on some hilltop. They look like a city or they look like a suburb. Um, and they have a, a public transport system that connects them and a, a road system that connects them. And for the most part, you won't see Palestinians, you won't interact with Palestinians. And the system is very much built in a way to make you feel this is just normal. You know, this has just happened to be where you live. So I think most settlers generally, and this is also true for, for most immigrant settlers, 
don't really understand the impact on Palestinian lives. In many cases, it'll be the opposite, right? They'll see Palestinians come to work in the settlement and we'll say, oh, we're giving them employment. Um, and, and again, I mean, I'm sure you can see a lot of uh, uh, comparisons to, um, to the US and, and other places where you'll see you know, people saying around uh, immigrants and so on, they should be grateful they're even getting jobs here or kind of all of these, that kind of rhetoric. You can also see it here um, in places where, I mean, the, the reason the Palestinians are working in those settlements are because previously their agricultural land is where the settlement is now and they lost that land or things like that. That's not something uh, that most people um, know when they move into these settlements. You know, we, we here in the West are, are heartened uh, periodically with news of various uh, successes, big and small, um, of uh, the BDS movement over the last number of years. Are you seeing the same kind of impact uh, 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 of BDS within Israel? And what are the next steps? What are the next steps? Uh, uh, is it further sanctions? But what are the next steps within the BDS movement? Well, I think as far as the impact goes, it is important to say that within Israeli discourse, um, boycotts are completely delegitimized. Uh, and there, there was an attempt to, to criminalize it. It's not criminal at the moment, but it is uh, something that opens you up for, for civil suits. Um, and so the whole discourse around it is boycott or calling for a boycott equals treason, more or less. I mean, it's, it's a very problematic uh, discourse, which also means every time there is a successful boycott campaign, the way it is presented in Israeli society is this anti-Semitic uh, attack and so on. And there's very little nuanced conversation about it. Um, so talking about the boycott movement here within Israel is not a very relevant uh, discourse, unfortunately. Um, as far as kind of the, the next steps of, of BDS, I'm definitely not the right person to ask. There is the Boycott National Committee, uh, Palestinian organization, um, umbrella organization that, that does a lot of those campaigns. And in different places, there are different campaigns. Um, I can tell you that a lot of the place generally the movement is going towards and has been for quite a few years, and I think is very important and interesting, is not just talking about what companies to boycott or divest from in the context of the human rights violations they are doing, um, but also in the context of what they are doing in whatever country they, they work in other places, right? So if we're talking about a company like Elbit Systems um, that here does drones and the fence and all kinds of different things that, that uh, hurt human rights, um, they are also doing the uh, watchtowers and drones in the US-Mexico border and part of the militarization of that border. And a lot of what the movement has been doing in recent years is making those connections and showing how these companies are profiting uh, from human rights violations in different places. Um, and I think that that's a really important direction, which again, continues to talk about boycotts, divestments, but does that in a place that also really connects it to uh, local struggles. Here's a question from uh, <clears throat> one of our mutual uh, good friends, Don Wagner. Um, what's the climate like around attacks on Iran and or Hezbollah, and how has the explosion in Beirut impacted that discussion? It's a great question. So, I mean, Iran has been slightly, um, I mean, with, with the specific attacks that have been uh, happening recently, but the general discourse around Iran and kind of the, its, it's will for annihilation of Israel and these things that we, we often hear as threats uh, being used here has been a little bit sidelined, um, mostly because, again, because of COVID and in many ways COVID has taken over the news cycle um, and, and the economic effects of COVID and so on. Uh, and so people aren't interested in, in war with Iran right now, or even with this theoretical threat that there might be in Iran, people are interested in how to finish the month. Um, and for a change, the government is seeing that. Um, and I think it is important to say at this point, also the Iranian government, right? Like the response to the attacks um, from the Iranian side has also not been very uh, anything or very significant because also in Iran, like this is what they're dealing with right now. Um, and in many ways, COVID is forcing governments to think differently about what they need to deal with. The question of Lebanon is, is very interesting uh, because I think what would have probably 
continued to be a little bit of back and forth of shooting around the border. And a lot of people were talking about um, Netanyahu using that to really hush, uh, uh, to silence the, um, the criticism against him within Israel, the political crisis that he's in, using a war with Lebanon, uh, with, with Hezbollah, to uh, counter that would probably be a kind of right out of his playbook. Um, but I think that in, in many ways, actually, what happened uh, now in Beirut uh, almost makes that impossible. Um, there's, a, there's been a fair amount of, of presentation of solidarity from Israelis. Um, and, and there is this kind of feeling, this is, this is just a humanitarian disaster, right? Forget about politics, forget about anything else. This is just a straight out disaster. And, we, and people are looking at the humans around it. Um, there is something to say about the, that being rather hypocritical. Israel has destroyed Beirut a couple of times. Um, and now when, when Beirut is being destroyed, we're, we're crying over it. I mean, there's a lot of hypocrisy involved in it. Um, but if we look at the political picture of what does that mean, I do think that it means that right now Israel is not in a place to start a war with Hezbollah. Um, and also Hezbollah is in a place where it has far bigger problems um, on in, in the, the Lebanese political sphere right now, especially with the resignation of the government. Um, so I think it's very, very early to, to understand how that's going to play out. But I think that Israel is probably going to play a, a much smaller role uh, in, in Lebanese politics uh, for a while now. Like I said, when we began, I've been bringing my groups to visit with you for a while now, for six or seven years. And one of the most moving parts of your presentation, and, and really to a person in the groups, my groups that have met with you, to a person, they mentioned a couple of things. And so I want you to share these with the rest of us, if you don't mind. Uh, the first one is when you talk about Israeli primary schools and the textbooks, when first graders learn their numbers using symbols from Israeli nationalism and military culture. And so I, I'd like for you to share that with us here, but with a, with a semicolon, uh, just a couple of days ago, 972 published this article titled Palestinians as Ghosts, How Israel's Education System Normalizes the Occupation. So they're connected and that's about high school textbooks. So if you could connect those two, but, but that first one, especially learning the numbers as first graders using symbols of Israeli nationalism. Um, yeah, so I mean, Israeli education in general is extremely militarized, and there really are a million of millions of examples of what that looks like. Uh, one of them, the, the one that you referred to, is actually um, a, a worksheet that was given to a child of a friend of mine in kindergarten, even before uh, primary school. Really, just learning your your one to tens, really basic counting, um, and there it has you know three symbols, so. It, instead of having three apples that you connect to the number three, it has three tanks that you connect to the number three, together with, with the Israeli flag and, and uh, airplanes and um, the, the Israeli symbol, the, the menorah. So kind of this, this mishmash of nationalism and, and the military being part of nationalism. Um, again, there, you can see examples from elementary school. I've, I've seen examples of, uh, of math school books for second grade using um, soldiers to, to learn how to count. So you have a platoon of 27 soldiers standing in three lines. How many rows are there? Or kind of, you know, just, just because that's, it's not just a way to normalize the military. I think the more important thing is if thinking about it as it's because the military is normalized, you use it in textbooks. And it's a circular thing, right? That it's not that the person writing a textbook is thinking, how do I normalize militarism? It's that militarism is so normalized for the person who's writing it that they put that as an example. And then for the kid, it becomes normalizing. Yeah. Um, so you have this kind of circular uh, effect that we're all part of. Um, and, and I think that that really, in, in many ways, is, is something fundamental to, to Israeli uh, culture. Uh, just if I do connect it to what's happening here politically today, um, so again, with, for instance, the, the attempts to look for a alternative for Netanyahu, uh, 
um, while the last alternative was supposed to be Gantz, uh, a pol uh, I don't want to call him a politician because up until five seconds ago, he wasn't a politician. He was just the former uh, chief of staff of the Israeli military. And that was his entire resume and made him qualified enough to run against Netanyahu. And after he's joined the government, uh, and now people are kind of looking for a new alternative, again, the first name to come up is another chief of staff of the military. <laughs> and so kind of this militarization, even when we talk about an alternative, is so strong. And I think that one of the things that's interesting with the protests happening now um, is actually how much the protesters are rejecting that. Um, and for instance, rejecting this idea that the next person should be just the next general. Um, and a lot of it has to also do, and, and I think we haven't really talked about this, but, but it, for me, it's really interesting. Is, is to do with a much more feminist perspective. A lot of the young activists that are kind of leading this younger generation are women. Um, a lot of the language, even of, of men, of women, of whoever, uh, that are talking here are, is a much more feminine language. It's a language that, that um, is, is expressing itself in, in art, in music. It, it, it's not trying to be macho uh, in these protests. Um, and it's really interesting to see how that really shifts the energy in the protest. There's been quite a lot of signs. Uh, Hebrew is a gendered language. So if you, any word that you use, you have to choose if you're saying it in masculine form or in feminine form. Um, and there's been quite a lot of signs saying we need a leader, but the leader in a feminine form, <laughs> you know, kind of really changing a bit of the discourse around that. Um, and I think it's interesting because I, I do think that Israeli militarism is, is, is tied up to masculinity uh, very strongly and has been constructed in that way. And in a way, this kind of women leadership of, of a protest movement also means that there's much more criticism of that militarism because women don't, don't fit as well in a militarist um, framework. So that's kind of a side point, but I think it's an interesting thing that's happening now. You know, and it raises to me maybe a sense of coalition building among liberation movements that, uh, you know, not this kind of go it alone, like you say, macho individualism, uh, but coalition building among movements. We're finding that here very, very strongly. I mean, the U.S. campaign for Palestinian rights just hired a new executive director who's very much interested in moving that, that organization, which has been moving in that direction for a while anyway, but to more coalition building. I know Friends of Sabeel has been all about... Uh, uh, coalition building with Black Lives Matter and Red Lives Matter and LGBT movement and Poor People's Campaign and others. So uh, uh, maybe that's connected as well. For sure. There's a lot of intersectionality in these protests. There's a lot of attempts. Uh, so tomorrow there's a, a panel organized in the tent city of these protests, uh, bringing together Palestinian activists, Ethiopian activists, um, Israeli activists around uh, the, the abduction of, of Yemeni children in the 50s and like really different issues of in Israeli society that have to do with racism from different aspects, bringing them together as part of this conversation. So there's a lot of that um, happening. Again, I don't want to paint a, a extremely pink picture. This is not the thousands of people involved in that. Um, it's, it's still in the outskirts of that protest movement but it's becoming a larger and larger outskirts and, and kind of a more and more relevant part of that conversation, the part that is making all those intersection, uh, intersectionality and, and connections. I want you to, uh, I want to return to the presentations that you did to my groups and maybe other groups too. Um, how, you talk about how this, the militarization of Israeli culture is built into the commemoration and celebration of uh, national holidays, but also Jewish holy days, and how they build upon each other. There's sort of a crescendo to sort of the uh, an expression of nationalism. Uh, say more, say more about that to us, will you? Yeah, I mean, I think all all societies kind of create their calendar, uh, right? And what are the days that you remember and, and what are the days that you kind of um, put forward and, and they mean, a, it says a lot about what your society prioritizes. And one of my kind of favorite examples of the creation of the Israeli narrative through the calendar, through holidays, 
um, is, is a month usually between April and May in the Hebrew calendar that starts with Passover. Um, the story of Passover is the story of the Exodus from Egypt. Uh, it's also the, the nation building story. Uh, it's the first time we use the term Israelites. Um, and, and it's a story of liberation from persecution. That's the core of what it is. And the main commandment of this holiday is to tell the story from generation to generation, much as a precautionary tale. Um, and it's, it's a lot about like one of the songs that we sing in the Passover dinner translates into in every generation, someone tries to exterminate us and then God saves us from them, right? This is kind of this ongoing feeling of extermination. A week after Passover ends is the Holocaust Memorial Day. A uh, week after that is the Soldiers and Victims of Terror Memorial Day. And the following morning is Independence Day. And in many ways, that arch, that arch that starts with the historical religious persecution of Jews from, from the moment we become Jews, right? <laughs> Um, with the Exodus and onwards and every generation, and then leads into the Holocaust, obviously being the worst example of that, and then leads into it being ongoing. The Soldiers Memorial Day is also the Memorial Day for Victims of Terror. It's kind of an ongoing thing. And then eventually ends with, with Independence Day and kind of the, the solution at the end of it. So it creates a very, very clear narrative. Um, and I think, again, just kind of bringing it uh, home, so to speak, to, to what happened this year. This year was extremely different. Again, we're under COVID. So it's a different world. Um, but for instance, uh, the Soldiers Memorial Day happened um, while still there were extreme restrictions. It, it was just a day or two after um, the, the overall, uh, no, actually, no, it was, it was still during the lockdown, the overall lockdown. And there was kind of a exemption through silence that people who will go up to, to the uh, cemeteries, the soldier cemeteries will not be fined. Will not like that will be like, it, it, it's so high up in our, it's, it's so sacred, right? That kind of secular sacredism. It's so high up there that even when there's a global pandemic and you have a complete lockdown and close everything, that is one thing you don't touch. Um, and I think that is interesting and kind of how central that is um, to, to Israeli discourse, to Israeli essence in many ways. We have, uh, we're, we're, I'm aware of the time. We have another question from the chat room. What's your prediction for the next round of Israeli elections, particularly regarding Nahu and Gantz? Will the protest movements have an impact? It's a great question, and it's, it, it, we need to start by the question, when will be the next round of Israeli elections? Because exactly. right now it looks like there's a chance it's going to be in November, uh, which will be quite a record, even for us. We love our elections, but that, that's a lot of them. Um, I, I mean, I think that the main problem that everybody is seeing is that it isn't clear what kind of alternative will be out there for uh, Netanyahu, and there's quite a few names running around. It is pretty clear that Gantz is not going to be a relevant name. Um, by joining Netanyahu's coalition, in many ways, he kind of clarified that he's not going to run again, um, or, or not doesn't have, doesn't stand a chance again. Um, and so people have already started kind of throwing out alternative names. Again, Gabi Ashkenazi, a former uh, chief of staff, has been one of them, but also the current mayor of Tel Aviv, Bon Kudai, has been uh, kind of a name thrown out, and, and there's a few other all old white men. Um, and, and again, I think a lot of the younger protesters are kind of saying, well, what's what's the alternative here, actually? Um, these are people who are not very far anywhere in their political views, kind of very centrist, so to speak. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, to see really if that is a direction. But I think the really interesting question will be what will happen internally within the Likud. Um, because the Likud is seeing some of their own voters leaving, um, on the one hand, and kind of seeing the instability, the political instability that Netanyahu is bringing to the party itself. And at the same time, are also seeing that a lot of people are extremely loyal to Netanyahu as a person. And he's been doing quite a few loyalty tests to his own uh, parliament, uh, to his own uh, party members in the last few weeks. Um, and so what, what the party itself will do will be very interesting. How much opposition from within the party he will see how many alternatives from within the party will try to run against him. 
I think those will be a lot of the things that will be really interesting to see how they shift uh, within within the political system. But honestly, it really depends on who's going to um, who's going to run against him and how popular they'll be able to be and how much they'll be able to cater to this new discourse uh, that is growing in in the protests. You know, um, when you talk about internal loyalty tests and how much how much uh, um, uh, opposition Netanyahu is going to receive from within his own party. Unfortunately, that sounds so familiar to us here in the U.S. with regard to uh, the president administration. Yeah. You want to say a word about the impact of uh, U.S. politics in Israel? Well, we thought we'd have a huge amount of, of, of impact right now with uh, with the annexation. I mean, it is important to say there was an annexation plan for, for July 1st or can still happen between now, uh, mainly in November. We're kind of in a window of opportunity uh, between uh, July 1st that already passed and the U.S. elections, because it is very clear that if Biden wins, annexation cannot happen. Israel can't afford um, the risk to, to go head to head with a, a U.S. administration, um, and and that is a possibility. Biden just might win, um, or Trump just might lose, and and if that does happen, Israel knows that they they only have these few months, and now we're talking about three months to go forward with annexation. Um, that said, because of COVID, because of what's happening here internally, that actually might be impossible. Uh, which means that that in many ways that the chances they'll have them before the U.S. elections are go, going uh, are, are really decreasing by the minute. Um, with the U.S. elections, if Trump does win, we'll have four years in which there's a very clear message to the Israeli government: you have four years to do whatever you want to. After these four years, you're probably going to have a democratic administration and not be able to do whatever you want to. But you have four years now to do whatever you want to. And that is a huge, I mean, that, that will be disastrous. Um, and we won't have COVID kind of protecting us as it very strangely is right now from, from annexation. Um, and so US politics has a huge effect on, on what's gonna happen here. And Biden has positioned himself already very critically uh, against Netanyahu at least. Um, and so it's definitely far from the anti-occupation statements we would wanna see. Uh, but it's it is signaling very clearly to the administration that it's not where Trump is is at. I want to wrap things up now, but uh, with another question, one more question for you. I want to give you an opportunity to say a word about the work of the Quakers, the American Friends Service Committee in Jerusalem and beyond, and then your work uh, as uh, Israel Program Director uh, at the office. So both of those. So American Friends Service Committee really works all around the world. Uh, and I have to say in the last few months, we've also been doing a huge amount of COVID relief. Um, so here in the Middle East, I can tell you we're, we're working very much uh, in Jordan with Syrian refugees. We're working uh, in the West Bank, we're working in Gaza. Um, so there's also uh, right now a lot of uh, kind of more relief work, but for the most part, uh, we do a lot of peace and justice work and the work uh, of the Israel program focuses on militarization within Israeli society, both culturally, uh, education, supporting of people who choose not to serve in the military, and everything that has to do with the military industrial complex uh, and kind of the profit that is made from that militarism. And just to say on that kind of connecting it to the general conversation we're having, for instance, when we talk about um, the, the surveillance of, uh, of people for COVID tracking, which is not happening only here, it's happening globally. There's a lot of companies, a lot of military companies that usually do um, spyware and surveillance and, and big data analysis for militaries that are now doing that here in Israel, Israeli companies who are doing it uh, here, but who are also exporting that technology for the same kind of surveillance as other places. So, I mean, all of these things are extremely, extremely uh, connected to each other. Uh, Sahar, uh, thanks for coming today. Do you have any parting words for us? I think the, the main thing, especially with, with kind of the, the follow-up from, from when this also around uh, not, not being bystanders, um, I think my main call, uh, especially in, in this specific time, 
uh, would really be, I mean, obviously, as always, to take action, but now I will very much highlight uh, the story in Silvan, uh, the story of the evictions of the Sumerian family, because there's so much to do from a North American perspective on that. So please go ahead and, and Google the Sumerian family, see the campaigns that are happening. Um, if not now, is, is campaigning a lot about this issue. So I really do encourage you uh, kind of to, to take part um, in that as well. Um, and generally, I mean, it's, it's um, as we said, it's also an exciting time for protests all around the world and people are awakening up to that. So it's just kind of great to, to be in a company where everyone's thinking about these things and seeing how they fit into that.